Great, so I'm here at the World Creators Summit uh, with Ralph uh, Pierre, the CEO of uh, Pierre Music. So, Ralph, it's great to have you on. How's it going today? It's a great, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, great, so let's, uh, let's start by talking about the, the legacy of Pierre Music. So, it's a company that uh, started out in uh, 1928 uh, and uh, is, is going strong to this day. So, uh, what is your secret to, to keep a healthy uh, publishing company uh, running for such a long time? Well, I think it's very import important to bar balance the privilege of having uh, a wonderful heritage catalog uh, with the ability to be flexible and to move quickly, provide services in the modern world. And uh, the two uh, do mesh in uh, many instances. And uh, we're able to, uh, to keep our heritage catalog fresh because we have a lot of younger people and executives who are very much involved in the contemporary market uh, who understand that that heritage catalog is very important to them. So they can view it from a modern point of view and, uh, and work with updating it, with making sure it gets out there for synchronizations along with today's current hits, which is what everyone is always looking for until they remember there's something else that they might use. Uh, so uh, I've been very fortunate that uh, we've had uh, wonderful executives uh, along the way, which I, who I've encouraged to make this blend of keeping in the contemporary market and to uh, remember the, uh, the songs from years gone by that are so important to us. Yeah, sure. And it's, it's all a question of making sure that the catalog that you have doesn't sit there idly and, and it, is, it is actually used uh, f for the new generations and uh, in, if anything, in the long tail of, 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 of the business, but it still brings in money. So. Well, we make a, a, a very proactive undertaking right. to right. bring that catalog material along because they're proven songs. Yeah. And if you go out today to get a proven song on the market and that you're working with, uh, with new material, yeah. you don't have that assurance that it's going to be as successful uh, as, as these that have already passed the, the test, if you will, the test of time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, for instance, uh, songs that everyone recognizes like You Are My Sunshine, we're, we're very, very active in getting them into ringtones uh, and uh, various uh, new media usages because if a new generation hears that music it's going to be acceptable to them in the in the sense that they're already uh, wonderful songs and uh, they'll they'll wear it in their consciousness as they do with contemporary material yeah. so it's very on the other side of that coin it's very important that we remain active in the contemporary market and uh, we uh, we invest our efforts in doing so sure. and looking at the technology sector of course um, well, because uh, a lot of the talks that are, are, are here, you know, are revolving around uh, the friction that still exists between the uh, technology sector and, and the creative cre creative industries. And uh, uh, looking at your perspective from a publisher's point of view, uh, when the technology companies started working in music and music startups starting operating, there was a lot of focus on, of course, getting the, the deals for the master recordings and perhaps publishing was, uh, you know, the, the awareness of how, what publishing was and how publishing worked for these companies came a little bit later. So how, how are you finding this, this market is evolving for you, for you guys uh, from a, a new technologist perspective? Well, in terms of the new markets, I think you're aware that we were a, an angel investor in eMusic, which was one of the first platforms that gained any significant traction yes. in terms of uh, selling uh, pure digital play uh, with uh, downloads over the internet. And we had this strange model of selling a la carte tracks at 99 cents a piece, which has a resonance in years, in years later. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, probably because I was there, publishing figured early on the game as, as to how rights were paid for. Uh, at that time, the major labels felt that they were going to take advantage of the new uh, realities, the new digital landscape, to control the music from what I would call the cradle to the grave, from production right through the distribution in, in the digital mode. And they were disintermediating the other uh, uh, the other sellers of, uh, of digital product yeah. in the process. A little bit like how travel agencies have felt with the online availability of tickets. Uh, and uh, this was, frankly, it was unhealthy uh, because they wouldn't license to us, they wouldn't license to any uh, upcoming uh, platform. So there, there was no platform at the time that encompassed the full range of music. I think at eMusic we had upwards of 85% of the independent uh, material available in the United States, important acts like Fish and so forth, um, and, uh, and, and we did well with what we had. But there was no place, no legitimate place, 
that the uh, buyer could go to get the uh, full range of, of masters. Yeah. And uh, frankly, I think that was a reason why an abstract had got so much traction, because that's very inconvenient to the consumer. So I felt the model was very good, and we had a payment structure in place that everyone was happy with. Uh, but it, uh, it, it, when along came Napster, it was very difficult for us. And as you know, that took several years in litigation. We were a plaintiff as pure music in the case because we, of course, weren't being paid, and we felt we, we and our composers ought to be paid for the uses. But my view of Napster is is not so much the hundreds of millions, maybe more. Uh, of dollars that were lost uh, to the licensing community, to the, to the rights holders, to the creators, but more what it did for the, uh, for the point of view of uh, the next generation, that the marginal value of a, cop a digital copy of a song was nil. And uh, it really created a value pricing scenario. You know, that term is, is when you put, when you value an item by its price. Uh, a quarter ounce of uh, Chanel Number no. Five Cologne or uh, perfume is not going to really be worth a hundred euros, but that's what people pay for it because of the image it's created. Well, we had the same issue, I think, with music, except it was the other end of the spectrum. The value that was associated was nil, and that was a most uh, most unfortunate occurrence because up until that time. Well, there might have been a few complaints, but most people in the tangible world did not feel music was overpriced for what you got. And it was not a complaint we had a lot. So I think that was really the greatest impact of the, of the online world. Uh, recovering from that has been long and hard, and, and I hope it's going in the right direction. When you say there's friction between the two, I'm not quite sure that's accurate other than the normal frictions that would be addressed between a, a buyer and seller of, of almost any price, uh, almost any item, yeah. uh, be it tangible or intangible, they're, they're pricing discussions are what's really going on. Yeah. And uh, those are um, particularly difficult uh, in uh, when new mu music uh, business models uh, flourish or come to, come to fruition anyway every day and you're looking for a, a fair licensing approach to that and you consider all the possible downsides and when you're in our position as a content owner and uh, and it, it means we're particularly cautious about issuing those licenses which is probably not a good thing but hard to get over. Yeah, sure. And you're also vice president of the NMPA and, and co copyright of course is uh, what you know brings us all here and what what gets this industry uh, working and, and produces the, the you know the value that that the societies and the publishers can can then get out of the music so uh, one of the key issues at the summit was the fact that in the US uh, there might be a review of, of, of the copyright uh, which uh, might uh, as it was illustrated it be done step by step instead of uh, just taking a view of, of the whole thing because that would take far too long and uh, and do you think that uh, there, there are dangers because, of course, uh, when we talk about bills, uh, there's always a danger that just a change in language, a change in a comma or something like that would uh, alter the way in which your rights can be exploited. Do you think uh, uh, it's feasible to, to foresee a, a positive outcome to this, to this review if all the parties come together in a, in a sort of positive manner? Well, I think it's unlikely the parties are going to come together in a positive manner. Uh, because, well, because the, the forces that be that are, uh, are encouraging this copyright review uh, have a very definite viewpoint that protection of intellectual property, per se, is inappropriate for the modern economy. And I personally think that's both short-sighted and, and foolish, because if you don't value a creator's output, uh, at uh, something real, uh, you are saying something about the way creators are handled or treated within a society. And I like to think that our society is very much enriched by the fact that uh, over years uh, creators have been encouraged and uh, through, uh, through commercial terms. Because although there certainly are some creators that create for the sake of creation, for the sake of beauty, if you will, and I have every respect for that. The fact of the matter is that if you can't concentrate on your art uh, and you really are doing a number of other things in order to sustain your livelihood, you're not going to uh, be able to hone it to a place where the public finds it acceptable, where you're able to do new things uh, with it. 
Uh, and it's a great loss for society when that happens. And I think those are the two issues that are at play in revamping copyright. There are a number of smaller issues uh, on which I think we will uh, be able to find common ground, uh, such matters as orphan rights, for instance. It's a very good point. Uh, and the reason it becomes a point, and, and that point being, of course, that there are works you can't identify, how do you license them? And we need to come up with a process whereby that can happen, is that for the first time with the, uh, the digital um, economy, we're able to provide an opportunity for those works to get to the public. It was very rare indeed that a work that had no uh, commercial potential and was therefore, because it had been lost or is lost because it never had commercial potential, that those works would be of, of, of interest or use, even, even in scholarly areas where they didn't have to pay copyright anyway. So that's being driven by that. I think it's good that there's this interest in a, in a wider range of music. Uh, and uh, I think we need to come up with a solution for it. So there's an example of a sidebar, which probably will be able to be saved uh, and, and presented as useful to all parties. Yeah, well, with positive development, sure. And uh, uh, looking at the at the international scene, and uh, you know, of course, we have societies from from all over the world. Uh, how are your relationships with? Uh, uh, services that are outside of the U.S. and you have a lot of dealings with, uh, uh, for example, either startups or new digital services that come from uh, uh, countries other than Europe and, and North America. Well, to answer your first question, uh, Peer Music uh, operates in uh, 27 countries and we have uh, relationships with societies in, in all those territories in a number of places. Uh, our executives have participated at a board level in those societies and work with the composers and the management of the societies. Uh, so we have a, a very strong relationships with them. As I said in my panel this morning, we certainly find that some societies are better at providing value uh, than others are. But uh, it's a range uh, of propositions and uh, we'd like to work with those societies that we don't find are that helpful to to bring them more to an area where they're really uh, doing their job on behalf of creators worldwide. One of the aspects you have with an international society system is that uh, many of the, uh, many of the uh, works being represented by any given society actually come from authors and publishers who are in different countries. And those people do not have uh, immediate representation on the boards of the local societies. So we uh, and other international publishers find ourselves always thinking about that element uh, of what the society is doing and uh, sometimes people have to be reminded that they, it's their privilege to represent these people sure. and they have a duty towards them. And finally, what is your impression on uh, the summit itself? Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting place to be because it brings together creators from all over the world and, and uh, societies that represent creators from all over the world. And uh, is it your first time here? And if not, it, how have you seen the event evolve? Well, I've been present at uh, Congresses sponsored by SISAC for many years. And they're always interesting for exactly the reasons you mentioned, that you have the viewpoints from individuals from uh, all over the world. Uh, I think this particular summit in Washington uh, is, uh, is more interesting than many I've attended simply because the new business models are coming to the fore and at the same time we have a little perspective of time of the difficulties uh, in the digital environment uh, of, of licensing and, uh, and handling uh, so many additional transactions and so many different types of licensing requirements. That's great. Well, thanks so much for your time and have a great rest of the day. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.